to our study on prayer here at Bible Talk as we continue on in, in search of Christianity. This is uh, the fifth part of this study that we're doing. And it's interesting because I realized that we're at the same spot that I was in in a study that I did over in the greater Manchester area in England, Oldham, England to be specific, uh, I guess about five years ago. So I thought it would be nice to incorporate that into here so you could see some of the folks, most of whom are still a t you know, part of, of, of the work that we do, good brothers and sisters, uh, not all of whom you will see in this video because some are out of camera. But this will pick up exactly where we left off in our study here last week. So let me get right into it. So here is part five of our study on prayer. Hi, I want to welcome you once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Here, once again, being Oldham in England, and we're at Joe Levy's office in Town Center in Oldham. We're continuing on in our study of prayer, uh, <clears throat> studying the Our Father, the prayer that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, I want to remind you that we're, we're always looking for your comments, your suggestions, any questions you might have. So feel free to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. So before we start, I'm just going to ask my brother Joseph here to uh, seek God's blessing upon our time together this evening. Lord, we know you're here right now, Heavenly Father, for you said where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst of them, Lord. So Father, we thank you for your presence in our midst. Lord, I pray that you speak through my brother, Lord, Heavenly Father. Father, just give us the word and bless this fellowship, Lord, Heavenly Father, that we might go and grow thereby, Lord, Heavenly Father, receive from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 What we're finding is most of this prayer, and again, you know, it's interesting because Jesus had talked in the Sermon on the Mount before he started teaching his prayer that God doesn't hear us for our many words. We're not supposed to just pray by rote. But, you know, from our hearts. And now he's saying, when you pray, pray this way. So this is this is a model for prayer. It's not something that's just supposed to be re repeated over and over and over. But it's, it's that is a teaching on the form of prayer our prayer should take. And uh, so where we, where we are as we conclude tonight is we, we've read, pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that's where we ended up in the last session. One of the things is, as we're asking the Father for these things, it's not so much to entreat him to do these things. As I've said over and over in this study, we don't have to convince God to love us. We don't have to convince God to be that Father who supplies our needs. These are all things that he's promised. This prayer, and prayer is a, always a dialogue. Yes. So it's important not only that we're speaking to God, but more important even, that we are listening to him. And what we're doing is proclaiming our understanding that he does these things. He does give us our daily bread. All right? He does forgive us. Faithful. He is absolutely faithful. So when we pray, and this is where we're starting now, in Matthew... Um, six. Yes, yeah, six thirteen. Thank you. Lead us not into temptation. God doesn't desire that we would ever fall. He has no desire that we would fall. No. You know, one of the things that Jesus said here in the Sermon on the Mount is, "Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect." Mm -hmm. His desire is that never, never does He have a desire to see us fail. Okay. So when we pray. Not to lead us into temptation. We need to come to a right understanding of this. Yes. God spoke through David, a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I'm sure you all know this, Psalm, Psalm 23. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads us in paths of righteousness. He's never going to lead us to a place of temptation. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we, what we're doing here is coming to that understanding that he doesn't lead us into temptation. You know, Jesus talked about there is a, a way that leads to life. It's a mm -hmm. narrow way. 
And that's the path that he leads us on, is that narrow path that leads to life. <clears throat> the only path that he leads us on, this good shepherd leads us on, is that narrow way that leads to life. The purpose of this prayer is to bring that great truth to our minds as we go before him. Okay? Um, we get tested. Yes. Testing is not to make you fail. You know, I, I think I think if you're a young child, sometimes you think that's what tests in school are all about, mm -hmm. to, just to see how badly you'll fail. Mm -hmm. the, the purpose is, because if you're being discipled, you're being trained in righteousness, mm -hmm. you know, you find out what you're doing wrong, that it might be corrected. Mm -hmm. You find out what you're doing right, that it might be strengthened. That's good. That's okay? Yes. Yeah. Because you correct what's wrong. That's, that's, that's how you grow. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... James writes, and he says in, in James 1.13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Okay? So God is never leading us into temptation. Quite the contrary, he is guided, guiding us in a path in which we are protected. It says that he goes before us. It mm -hmm. also says in Isaiah that he's our rear guard. Rear guard yes. I mean, he's got us covered. Yes. Okay? But that narrow way, exactly how narrow is the narrow way that he leads us on? Oh, brother, it's narrow. It's a narrow way. It's like you said, it's like a tight road. It's like a tight road. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is. And the devil wants, you know, he wants you off that, that path. <coughs> yes, he does. Because think about it. If you're on that path with Jesus before you and it, as your rear guard, the devil can't get you. Mm -hmm. So what he has to do is get you off that path. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, he doesn't care which direction you go off. Yeah. You, can no. go, you can go off to the right, you can go off to the left. Yeah. As long it doesn't as you're matter. Off. Right. This, it's interesting because you know, the word talks about the royal law of love. Mm. And that's that path that we're supposed to walk, is that royal law of love. Well, on one side, there is legalism, mm -hmm. you know, where you live according to the law. Like the Galatians were doing when Paul had to correct them, all you foolish Galatians, who have to be witches. <laughs> That's like off to one side. But the other side is licentiousness. Mm -hmm. Where you think that because of the grace of God, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, you, it's all right to sin because God is forgiven. Yeah, it's right to mess about so it. it's like that's one side, and there's the other side. And the devil doesn't care which side you go off as long as you go off. Mm -hmm. But if you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter, the finisher of your faith, mm -hmm. you're going to follow that path. Mm -hmm. So how does the devil try and get you off the path? That's by tempting you. Mm -hmm. yeah. He would lead you into temptation. Mm -hmm. And what he does, because on that narrow path, there is nothing before you or behind you but Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. okay? So what does he do? He sets traps mm -hmm. and baits those traps mm -hmm. with things that in your flesh you would be attracted to. Yes. 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 Yeah, he does. Yes. Yeah, he, he wants to lure you off that narrow path. So he will set traps off that off that narrow path and bait it with things. Now, bait has to be attracted to you. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you were going to try and trap me, even in the flesh, you would, yeah, we you wouldn't use asparagus. You wouldn't bait the trap with asparagus. No, no, no. Oh, no. Devil. Oh! Use asparagus. That, that, that. No, that, that won't work. He's going to use something that you like. Mm -hmm. How does the devil know what you like? He is not a mind reader. No. We okay? tell him. We tell him. Because we confess yeah. out of our mouth. We're talking about the things that are attractive to our flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So now he knows what to bait the trap with. All right? Yeah. So God, remember, he's not leading us into temptation. And he knows what the deal is. It says in Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That's about our prayer life. We have confidence to go before the throne of grace, because we know that Christ was tempted he who is there interceding for us all the time has been tempted in all things as we are. Yeah. There's nothing new. You know, and it, 
there's no temptation that's not common to me. I mean, you know, everybody tends to think, well, you know, you don't understand what I'm going through. I promise you, Jesus understands what you're going through. He's been tempted in all the things that you will ever be tempted with. He resisted. And how did he resist? Well, think about the temptations in the wilderness, where there is literally this confrontation between Jesus Christ and Satan himself. And Satan holds these temptations, and Jesus says, it is written. It is written. It is written. This is the weapon that we have to battle the devil, is the word of God. Okay? So bear that in, in mind, all right? That when we're praying, we need to recognize that even as we're praying, this, that Jesus will never lead us into temptation. If we're following him, he will only lead us in paths of righteousness. It is the devil who would desire to tempt us. So now we pray, we pray the next part of that is, but deliver us from evil. Yeah. Well, God, I promise you, he is a deliverer. He is a deliverer. I mean, this is, you know, where the people of God start, so to speak. You know, beyond Abraham, you get to Moses. And the people of God are in bondage in Egypt. And God sends Moses, the most humble of men, prophets. Yes into the land to deliver his people. And that was a foreshadowing, a foretaste of Christ to come. And Moses said that, that there would be one who comes after him even greater than him. Right? Yes. There's nothing that Jesus can't deliver you from. Nothing. Nothing. I, sometimes, you know, our prayer life is about, oh, and, and we've, we've talked about this before, yeah. but I think it, you know, it's worth restating. Mm -hmm. Our prayer life can be a confession of our disbelief. Our prayer, our prayer life can be, a, you know, uh, an exhibit of our lack of faith. Mm -hmm. When we pray, we're praying about the things when we're, we're not trusting the Lord. You know, and, and the example I used, I think, throughout this was the apostles in the in the boat going across the Sea of Galilee with Jesus when the storm arises, mm -hmm. and they go, you know, these are men, many, a few of them who had been grown up on the sea, they knew the sea really well, and yet here the storm arises. And Jesus, meanwhile, the carpenter, is sleeping in the back of the boat. That's how troubled he is. <laughs> and they go and they say to Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? That's prayer. Yes. What is prayer other than conversation with God? Well, that was conversation with God. And they say, don't you care that we're perishing? Well, Jesus, doesn't he care? Of course he does. Of course he does. He loves you, all right? He died for us. He died for us. And then he says to them, oh, you have little faith. Mm -hmm. Because their prayer was a confession of their lack of faith. Yes. He had said to them, we're going to the other side. Yes. He said it. It's happening. It's, right? done. it's a done deal. It's the same he said to Peter at some point. He said, uh, Satan desire to see yes. you. Yes. 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 But I've prayed that your faith. Oh, my God. That is Absolutely. So I wanted to read to you from Psalm 91. Yeah. Right? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. Mm -hmm. So he is the one that delivers you from that snare of the trapper. Mm -hmm. And even if you do go off the trail, it says in, in Ecclesiastes that two are better than one for their labor. Yes. If you fall, he doesn't stand there and condemn you. He reaches down to lift you back up. Yeah. He's always there to lift you back up. He's right? the shepherd, the great He's shepherd. Not. It's like the woman who was caught in adultery. You know that story? Mm -hmm. right? This woman is caught in adultery and the Pharisees are there and all they're doing is condemning her. They want her to be stoned to death. And they confront Jesus because they're always trying to trap him. <laughs> you know, and, and he, you know the story, he writes in the sand and these, these men, that you, without sin, cast the first stone. They all, they all leave because they're confronted with the presence and the love of Jesus Christ. But he turns to the woman and says, "Woman, where are, you, where are your condemners, accusers? accusers? They're gone." And she, he says, "Neither do I condemn them." But he says, "Go and sin no more." Mm -hmm. So he is always there, and he doesn't. He didn't come to bring condemnation. You know, everybody knows John three sixteen. But I don't know how many people know as well John 17. John 3.16. John 3.17. John 3.16 is for God so loved the world 
Maybe look at 17. He said, I haven't counted the world to judge the world. The, the world to him might be saved. To save. Yeah, the next one says, Mental of darkness. Right, absolutely. And I was so just going to insist a little bit. I there's something, oh, sorry. There's yeah. something you mentioned last night, last time I've just yeah. been writing in my notes, and uh, it's about. We, we ask these things that we want God to do, or we pray about this and the other. The, the, the bar has been set to the standard at which we should measure the desires of our hearts. Mm. Right. That there's nothing we can ever ask of this one, actually in this earth, that compares to him finding that to serve us, his son has to die. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so, yeah, so far. And, you know, we didn't have to convince him to do that. No. We didn't have to ask him to do that. Yeah. I mean, this was what God did because he is love. And yeah. love is love for us. For God so loved the world. And, and this, by the way, um, I want to say something because you may be hearing voices coming out of here um, and that, that are not showing up in the camera. Obviously, we, you know, in this setting, we don't get everybody into the camera. So you, you may hear from Trent. You may hear from Emmanuel. You may hear from Kevin. You may hear from Madeline. And you may not see them in the, in the camera. But they are here and participating. Amen. So, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So we don't we don't have to convince God to love us. No. We don't have to convince Him to bless us. I mean that that's what, what we truly above all need to learn about prayer. That's not the purpose of prayer, and yet that's what consumes most people's prayer life. Isn't it most of the time too that when we're praying, it's almost like we're begging Him? That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. Yeah. To do things, you know, and, and again, I, I think you know, rather than rehash the whole thing, if you haven't seen the previous Bible studies on prayer, the last three, mm -hmm. please take take some time and, and go watch them because um, we talked about you know this prayer starts with the words "Our Father." This is about a relationship mm -hmm. with a Father, mm -hmm. and we are the children of God. The Spirit yes. of God bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. Mm -hmm. You know. And we use the example a lot of Joseph and, and his children. His children don't have to convince him. They don't have to come every day. and to, They don't have to convince him to feed them, to put a roof over their heads. They don't have to convince Joe to love him. And if Joe, being a worldly father, which means with imperfections, my brother, working for this. And if he loves his children and takes care of them like that, imagine how our Heavenly Father takes care of us. So that's not what prayer is about. And yet that's what consumes most people's prayer life. And that's what we're trying to deal with right here. But it, here's the promise. I mean, in Psalm 91 that we're reading, it says, he is, it, it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper. He leads us in paths of right. We don't have to convince him to do this. He said this, and he watches over his word to perform it. That's what he spoke to Jeremiah. It says in the law that no promise that he has promised has ever failed to come to pass. Okay? He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. These are days when we are surrounded by evil. These are days when we are surrounded by pestilence that stalks in darkness, destruction that lays waste in human. I mean, look what's happened to the world economy in the last few years. Look what's happened to the job market and the housing market in most of the developed world in the last few years. We're to do our work as unto the Lord. We used to work for the Lord, right? If you work for the Lord, He may have you work as a carpenter, He may have you work as an electrician, He may have you work as a doctor. <coughs> but you know if you work for Him, you can never get fired. You can get transferred, but you can't get fired. You'll never lack a house. Because you've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I mean, it, it comes down to our attitude and our trust in His Word. Are we going to believe what the world is saying, or are we going to believe what the Word is saying? Because that's going to determine your attitude, and your attitude is going to determine your prayer life. That's right. That's right. 
He will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion, the cobra, the young lion, the serpent, you will trample down. You know, Jesus gave us authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. You believe that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's particularly easy to believe if you don't encounter it a lot. But Alice and I have had the blessing. We've had the real blessing, snakes. you know, to live in the jungle and wake up in bed at night with scorpions and snakes in the bed with us. And you get to a place where you decide either I believe this or I don't believe it. It's got to be real. Yeah. You know, what, the reason we're studying prayer is not so we become Bible scholars, not so we become theologians and uh, can dress like the Pharisees and go out and stand on the street corners. It's so that we can apply these things in our life and start living that triumphant life in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, we were talking today about the Apostle Paul. And you read what he said in Corinthians, and I can't, you know, quote the entire thing, that he was in danger from, from his from countrymen. his countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles. You see. He was beaten times, three times. He was ship, uh, beaten times without a number of shipwrecked three times. You know, he, he was in danger in the city, danger in the country. He lists this whole thing. I said, of course, of course he lacks a fiction. Yeah, this is... Yeah, he's, this is a great call to ministry, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but Paul also said, we walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. It depends on your perspective, your attitude. And that's what will determine what you pray. Whether you go before God. You know, this whole thing started, again, I go back to the beginning. Our Father, how will be that? It's about blessing the name of God. And if you're in a panic about your situation, you're not going to go before him first and start blessing him. That's right. You're going to go hollering and screaming and praying, you know, help me, help me. Don't you care that I'm perishing? Oh, yeah. We're going to do this before. <laughs> Instead of going before him, praising his name, blessing him, giving thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. How can you give thanks if you think that the situation has been all wrong. How can you give thanks if you think that everything's out of control? How can you give thanks unless you know that God is in control and that you're taken care of? Yeah, because if you think it's against you, you're not going to think that's all right. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. right. So, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known me my name. Um, what's the name of God? Okay. Well, yeah, he does. You, know, I, you, you might probably not understand this, and this may offend a lot of you, but uh, if, it, if it does offend any of you, just remember, repent. Uh, because those who love thy Lord shall great peace, and nothing shall offend them. So if you get offended, you don't love God's word quite as much as you might think you do. <laughs> but I used to say that having grown up in New York City, um, which had, where I grew up, the three top baseball teams in the world, okay? The Yankees, the Dodgers, and the Giants. I grew up in a, that culture of baseball. But it, it came, there were a lot of Puerto Rican baseball players in New York. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yes. And you may not be aware of this, but if you were to stand on the street corner, because it says that those who call upon the name of the Lord, shall we say, you stood on a street corner in, in, in the Bronx, for example, and hollered at the top of your lungs, Jesus, mm. you'd wind up with 87... Puerto Rican baseball players all named Jesus come running to see what was wrong. So, uh, but his name is Deliverer. His name is Savior. His name, I mean, he has a lot of names. Yeah, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Lord. The Lord of the Council. Yeah. Yeah. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. The Lion, the Morning Star, the Lily of the Valley, the Rose of the Sun. So, but if you don't know that he is your deliverer, you won't call on for deliverance. Because every name, every, every name relates to a situation. It does relate to a situation, yes. and that's exactly right, and that's what's important. Yes. Because if you don't know that he is the provider, that you probably won't call on when you need permission. Yes. If you don't know that he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, you won't call on him as healer. Okay? 
You, you need to know that these these are the attributes, the things of God. These, mm -hmm. This is what God is. And so I'm working yes. at trying to have love. Oh my God. Hallelujah. Yeah, he's awesome. And God help me because he's poured his love into my heart through his Holy Spirit, as it says in Romans. But the fact of the matter is, I may have love. God is love. Yes. And there is a difference yes. between the two. Yes. yes. There is. Yes. He is our provider. He is our deliverer. He is our healer. And you need to come to know him as these things, yes. so in order that you will call on him for these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we come to know him, we do like Jesus did. His prayer was, I thank you, Father, that you always hear me. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Your prayer life changes. Mm -hmm. I think yes. I think we've talked about this a couple of times, and yes. it is so important. When you understand that he is your deliverer, right? That he will not lead you into temptation, but he will deliver you from it. Mm -hmm. That it frees you up to pray differently. You don't stop praying. Mm -hmm. You pray differently. Mm -hmm. And and I you know again just to use the example of you want to talk about having problems. Job, go read the book of Job. I mean you got forty one chapters of misery. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean even his wife looked at him and said, "Hey, uh, curse God and die." I mean you know it's, he was not having a good time. <laughs> and. And he had sympathizers, his friends. He talks about his three friends. They're sympathizers. I, in the, in the uh, 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, the story of Lazarus, the account of Lazarus. When Lazarus had been laid in the tomb, it talks about his sisters, Martha and Mary. And it says that people were coming from Jerusalem to sympathize with them, to comfort them. Well, that sounds nice. Nice. But rather than having somebody come into your life saying, poor baby, poor baby, mm -hmm. Jesus did not come to sympathize. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to that tomb to bring life. Mm -hmm. I don't want sympathy, I want life. Mm -hmm. And the Word of God can bring life into your situation. Yes. So when you're free to do that, like with, with Job, as I was saying, after all of this gets out and God sends him his Word through Elihu, and then God speaks to him directly, after 41 chapters, you know what it says? Job prayed for his friends. All of a sudden, his thoughts are not about himself. All of a sudden, his prayer life is not all about himself. He is free from that because he has heard the mighty, thundering voice of God. And he starts praying for others. When he starts to pray for his friends, God restores his fortunes. God doesn't want you to stop praying. God wants you to have a How about that's not a machine gun? <laughs> God, I don't really care if it's a machine gun. I, you know, it's the idea that it frees you up to start praying for other things. You can take that time in conversation with Him, because remember, prayer is conversation with Him. And you can be taking that time in prayer to do what? To praise Him, to proclaim His excellencies, to pray for others. This is where our prayer life gets powerful. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you get to understand that tr He truly is the Deliverer, mm -hmm. yes. your prayer life can become very, very, I have to watch, very, becomes very unchristian. Mm -hmm. well, becomes very unreligious. How about that? Yes. Yes. That's mm -hmm. it's acceptable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or it becomes almost invisible in some time. <laughs> in some way. Yes. Because when you're in constant conversation, it just becomes, you know, it, it, it's like it almost disappears. <clears throat> yeah. If you can accept the fact that prayer is conversation with the Lord, right. not you talking to Him on occasion, but this, how often do I talk to you? How often do you talk to me? Yeah. Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> We may have to destroy this tape. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. We don't have a lot of words going back and forth. What do we talk about? Oh, we talk about the Word. We talk about Jesus. We talk about our corner. We talk about the seminar. We talk about... Oh. We talk about everything. Well, I thought you meant something in particular. No, I don't mean in particular. That's, that's the whole point. Yeah. It's not something in particular. Uh, we talk about everything. We talk about everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and it, the conversation is constant. And it, it's not like, okay, there has to be something wrong before we sit down and talk. Oh, I, yeah, I get you. Ah, you get me. Yeah. Whew.
<laughs> that was a close call. Yeah, it was a safe home then. <laughs> yeah. Great. Now I understand. <laughs> no, but that should be, we should get to that place with our, with our conversation with the Lord is not exceptional prayer time. Yeah. It just becomes the norm of our life.